All right. Oh, we are we are live <laughs> just like that. <laughs> just that quick. Mm. Well, um, I want to wait and see if anyone tunes in. But um, mm. thank you, Sarah, for being here with me today. Um, I'll go ahead and kick off our um, discussion today. So it is all about dealing with grief during the holidays mm -hmm. and, um, you know, just letting everyone know that we all grieve differently and that's okay. Yeah. So first of all, I pop up on your timelines, I'm sure enough, so you guys know who I am, but my name is Ashley Jackson. I am a caregiver to my husband. I'm a wife, business owner, Timeless Dream Events, caregiver advocate, and a new author as of June this year. Mm -hmm. um, and through my caregiver advocacy, I have had the great fortune to find Miss Sarah Cobb mm -hmm. from My Grief Connection. And for you um, guys out there that have um, heard me speak about my story and have read my book, you know that I talk in great links about not just my caregiving journey, but also my grief journey. Um, so I wanted to have this discussion with Sarah Cobb. Um, again, she is the founder of uh, My Grief Connection, which is basically a hub of grief resources and mm -hmm. a support community for those of us on a grief journey. Um, she felt called to connect to fellow grievers with resources to find hope and healing after loss following the tragic deaths of not just one, but two of her older brothers, 43 years apart. Um, one was by a freak accident and one was in a murder suicide. So she uh, turned her passion and um, used her passion and um, brought her purpose to life for advocacy of, of grievers, basically. Mm -hmm. And she is now continu continuing her education. Mm -hmm. And what are you doing? Well, I'm going to hand it over to you. Oh. So what are you doing with yeah, um, so I actually just started graduate school in September. Um, I'm going to, um, well, I'm, I'm in a um, counseling education program. So basically studying to be um, a licensed professional counselor. Um, and my emphasis area is um, the clinical mental health counseling with grief, trauma, and crisis as sort of the focus. So um, yeah, it's I, I'm brand new at it. I'm like just finishing up my first semester. So I'm like rolling into these last few weeks of like finals and final papers and projects and stuff. Um, so it's it's been it's been really interesting so far. I've learned a lot in the last just few months, um, and you know, continue. Hopefully, um, we'll continue on with that over the next couple of years and and um, make it through the program. It's definitely challenging. It's been a long time since I've been in school, so it's a new thing to kind of be back at it. But um, I'm really enjoying it and um, and learning a lot and feeling like I'm you know where I need to be right now. And I don't know how it's all going to work out in the end. Uh, we never knew, do, I guess. But um, I, I know that there's a reason that I'm here right now doing this and, and studying yeah. this stuff and um, connecting with all the people I'm, I'm connecting with at school and through my grief connection. So um, it's, it's really exciting to see how things are unfolding. I have no doubt that you're going to make it through. I mean, just to be that determined even later in life, I think it's harder to go later in life back to school because of... <laughs> You know, some of us are married, have kids, you know, mm -hmm. your full time positions and mm -hmm. I mean, all those things. So I have yeah. no doubt that you'll you'll make uh -huh. it through. <laughs> um, so I know I, I read a little bit about you, but mm -hmm. these people have heard so much about me and my story. Mm -hmm. They're probably mm -hmm. like, oh, goodness, thank God she has a guest. <laughs> so <laughs> tell us a little bit yeah. more about, you know. Yeah. Your, your grief journey and how you found yourself, my grief connection before we hop into the holiday theme of, of our talk today. 
Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, my grief story um, maybe is a, a little bit unusual, I guess. Uh, I mean, I had my first major loss before I was even born. Um, I uh, I had an older brother named Stephen, and um, when he was about six years old, he was almost seven, actually, just shy of his seventh birthday. Uh, he and my other older brother, Skylar, um, were outside playing in, a, in kind of a field or wooded area behind my parents' home. At the time, my folks lived in South Korea. They were missionaries there. Um, and um, the kids were playing out there. They thought they were frontiersmen. You know, they wanted to be like Daniel Boone and they had their coonskin caps and their little toy guns. And um, unfortunately that day, Stevie climbed up an electrical tower uh, that had a low slung wire and his, his gun touched that wire and caused a big electrical explosion. And um, so he was electrocuted and um, had about 30,000 volts of electricity go through him, um, burned his clothes and hair off and left him sort of caught um, on this tower dangling there and I made a, a large boom and, you know, noise and smoke and everything. So Skylar witnessed this happen. And then my parents heard it and came running and, um, you know, they, th they thought they had lost him instantly, but, um, as they were trying to get him down from this tower, uh, when the, when the power company came, they realized he was actually still alive. And, um, they got him to the hospital and, and got treatment, but um, he was burned over 75% of his body and just had a lot of internal injuries and stuff. So he, he was not able to recover from that, unfortunately. And he died about 33 hours after the accident happened. Um, so that just sort of, you know, put our family into this, thrust them into grief, you know, of course, very suddenly and unexpectedly and um, very traumatic kind of loss, of course. Um, but that was the mid seventies and they didn't really fully understand, you know, how to treat trauma and grief. Um, they didn't understand about adverse childhood experiences and about how those things can really affect a child, you know, when they're, when they're young and they go through um, a huge trauma like that. So um, it had a big effect, you know, this whole event, of course, on our whole family, a ripple effect that lasted, that's lasted our whole um, lives, you know, going forward. And, um, um, you know, everything changed, of course. And then I was born 11 months after Stevie died, um, which I think was uh, a healing thing for the family. You know, they they were happy to have um, a new member and um, uh, and it was it was good, you know, helping them to to move forward and find some hope and some joy in life. Um, I was definitely going to ask uh, how yeah. that I didn't want to interrupt. Mm -hmm. I, I was definitely going to ask how that dynamic might have changed yeah. or what that meant for your parents to yeah. have that loss, that sudden loss. And then yeah, be greeted with the happy, joyous noise, uh, uh, news, excuse mm -hmm. me, that, um, they're pregnant again. Um, mm -hmm. but so shortly, it was very shortly thereafter then, right. You said 11 months. Yeah. 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 So it was probably about three months after Stevie died that, that they became expecting, I guess. And so <laughs> I mean, that was, it was, part of the process of healing, you know, for my parents to have um, connection together. And um, I, they, had, they had always wanted to have a, another child anyway. And actually Stevie had begged them for a baby sister. So, um, oh. you know, um, I, my mom wrote me a sweet letter later, years later saying how much Stevie wanted a sister and how happy he would be um, that I was born. But, you know, they're, they're yeah. sad that I never, we got to, never got to meet in person, but I feel like, um, you know, he's been looking over me my, uh, my whole life. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, definitely things shifted in the family, it, you know, changed. Um, but, um, and of course we wish Stevie was with us, but, um, that's just not what happened. And so we had to kind of go forward and continue on with our lives, uh, by trying to honor his life and by, um, by doing the best that we could to to all find meaning and purpose in our own lives and um and just live forward so we know he would be proud of us um you know we had another um child born in the family about seven years after i was born a uh, surprise um baby brother uh who i love so much adam uh was born and uh so I grew up the middle and the girl basically between these two boys that were living and of course stevie that was in heaven um and uh you know, it, it was, it was good. You know, we had a, I had a great life growing up, but definitely some challenges and some effects, um, 
of course, of Stevie's loss um, on our family and the dynamics and everything. And for Skylar, um, it was very difficult, you know, to have gone through that trauma. And um, I feel like, you know, he really struggled a lot with feeling that survivor's guilt. And um, he knew Stevie, you know, when I didn't um, personally. So he had this personal deep grief and loss after that. And, um, you know, I don't feel like they they did my parents of course did their best to support him and love him and uh, make him um you know uh, give him a, that supportive environment as much as they could but you know i think there was a lot of unresolved grief and trauma um that that Skyler lived with um for the rest of his life you know he he worked on on um processing that grief in many ways but it was just um such a fundamental i think um, wound that he had that um, made it very difficult for him growing up and had some rough times as a teenager and um, um, and even as a young adult and um, ended up, um, I think, really strugg struggling with his mental health. And I think a lot of that has to do with, with um, this deep trauma that he had early on in life. Um, so anyway, fast forward <laughs> several years, um, Skylar ended up um, unfortunately dying by suicide about three and a half years ago. And um, not only did he take his own life, but he took the life of his fiance as well. Um, you know, it's a complicated um, thing. These kind of these kind of losses are very complicated. There's no easy answers. People, you know, want to know like, why, what happened? How did this happen? What, you know, how, how did they get to this point? And it's, it's, um, there's no, there's no easy answers. And there's, um, a lot of things that we'll never know as to um, why this this particular event happened, but you know we do know that that like I said he did struggle with some mental health issues over the years. Um, he had been doing pretty well actually um, in the in the months and days kind of leading up to this incident, but um, but I think maybe there were some things going on that he wasn't sharing uh, with us about his his um, kind of emotional state. Um, and I know he was in a really romantic or uh, intense sort of romantic relationship with his fiance and they had um, some dysfunction and, and codependency going on there. They both had their own issues. She had a lot of um, also grief and, and some um, struggles with um, with alcohol use and things like that that were um, causing some issues in their relationship. And I just think, you know. Um, things just got really heated that day and they got into a fight, we believe, and were probably about to break up or maybe she had um, said she was going to leave. I, we don't know a lot of the details of that, but enough that, you know, it really threw him into this hypomanic sort of state. Um, and, you know, um, it was a holiday, so they had both been kind of drinking and celebrating the holiday. And so I think just kind of a perfect storm of things happened that, you um, that, you know, maybe on a different day, um, things would have been different. But for some reason that day, the way things aligned um, emotionally and with what was going on in their lives and, you know, all that, um, things just got to this kind of critical point. And um, in in that moment of hypomania and just impulsivity, um, he grabbed a, a gun that was um, available to him with just kind of his fingerprint on a, on a little safe that was right there in the room. And so... Um, he, he just without thinking, I think, you know, just in, in that moment of intensity, um, ended up shooting her and um, then, you know, realizing what he did and uh, just the weight of that, the burden of, of that guilt and, and that shame and um, sadness and feeling like, you know, he, he wouldn't be able to go on without her and wouldn't be able, of course, to, to face all of the horrible consequences that her death would um would bring um he ended up taking his own life and yeah i mean just totally changed my world you know um did not have any inkling that anything like that would ever happen and um i definitely knew you know, because of his struggles with mental health that um you know that there was a possibility that at some point um he could he could maybe hurt himself um, if things were to ever get really bad again, but um, things seem to have been, you know, doing pretty well. So it wasn't something that was like on our minds as like this was an imminent threat or anything at all like that, you know. And um, and there's a lot of evidence that shows like that day that he had no plans to do this, you know, um, that this was just a very impulsive in the moment thing. 
Um, so you can't prepare for that. You know, there's no, there's no way to kind of brace yourself for that sort of um, shocking loss. Oh, I'm sure not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I did want to ask um, because mm-hmm. you, you mentioned to me before what today was, but could, mm-hmm. and I know there's some extra emotions going on mm-hmm. for you today, but could you let um, the audience know what today is? Yeah. Yeah. Today is the um, International um, Survivors of Suicide Loss Day. So it is a very um, important, meaningful day to me as a survivor of suicide loss um, and as a supporter of other survivors. You know, um, it's it's something that we live with every day and that to us, you know, we feel the loss all the time. Um, but it is nice to have a day that we can kind of maybe more openly sort of share about what our experience is like and um, hopefully receive support from others um, and um, just get some awareness out there and let people know that, you know, um, that that it's important that that survivors um, have have support and that we have connection and absolutely um, that there are resources for us and, and that we need those, you know, and especially in the case of murder suicide loss, there's almost nothing out there for survivors of murder suicide loss. It's even more stigmatized than just regular suicide. And so um, that's something that I have actually um, worked to create some resources myself because I couldn't find what I needed. You know, I went two and a half years without talking to another survivor of murder suicide. You made um, for my own family. You know, I didn't didn't know how to find it. I searched. I, I googled. You know, like, and I'm good at researching this stuff. This is what I do, and I still couldn't find very much. Maybe a couple of articles and one or two books, and um, but no support groups or anything. And um, I got lucky last summer and found an article written by another survivor. Um, her name is uh, Brittany Noble McCarthy. Um, she had an article on the TAPS.org website, which is um, a support resource site for military loss. Um, and she wrote about her experience losing her father and stepmother in, um, in a murder-suicide. And I was like, oh my gosh, thank God someone else is talking oh, yeah. about this. And, um, you know, I just felt such a connection to her words and, and to her story. And... Um, you know, I was so grateful that somebody else was but had the courage to to talk publicly about it. And um, I had spoken a little bit like, you know, at a, at a live event about it and and, sh- and shared a little bit about that on my website. But I, I really hadn't um, shared super widely about my loss um, publicly um, in detail before. But I was also kind of looking for some sort of template for like, how do you talk about this, you know? And uh, I found her article and we connected and and ha- talked and it was such a relief to talk to another survivor that kind of understood um, the, the kind of nuances of this type of loss. And um, even though our particular stories were a little bit different, we still really connected and still felt um, that understanding um, and and that, um, that empathy for each other's stories. Yeah. And we could really relate to a lot of the same emotions and stuff. So that was wonderful. And then um, we actually both started having some people reach out to us. I, I had posted a video about a, uh, the speech I did um, at a suicide prevention walk where I, I told my story for the first time. Uh, I posted that on my website, shared it on my Instagram, and a couple of people reached out to me that were survivors and was like, oh my gosh, I haven't found any other support resources for this and I'm a survivor too. And then she had a couple of people reach out to her because of her article. And um, we had a conversation where we started talking about how like, oh, we should have like a little Zoom, you know, group yeah little support group for us like you know let's just all get together and have a call and then that sort of evolved to like well we should just start a support group there's obviously people that need it so why why don't we just start doing that and see how it goes exactly uh, actually a year ago so it was it was last mid mid november last year we started our little support group via zoom and um had probably five or six of us maybe in that meeting and um we've kept going and we meet pretty much every other week, um, try to meet twice a month on Zoom on Friday evenings. And we just you wow. know, share about our stories and it gives us all a safe space to um, to connect and um, to talk about this kind of loss that doesn't really have any other sort of safe, open <laughs> um, sure. a container for it, you know? And um, so it's it's been just amazing and we have been so, you know, so lucky the people that have joined the group are just amazing people. And um, 
we've had people join um, that have that have found our group within like the first two or three weeks after their loss, which is amazing that they're actually finding a support group so quickly when the two of us, like it was more than two years before either of us even talked to another survivor. So um, it's just so gratifying to know that, you know, people are, are um, finding help right away. And that's, that's so important. And then we have people that have been, you know, had been years without um, talking to another survivor. And yeah. I think we have one now that just, just joined recently and it was 30 years um, of, of him just being alone with no, no other, uh, connection to any other survivors of this kind of loss. And, and it just breaks my heart that people are suffering for so long. Yeah. Um, I mean, cause I, I, and I, I can't relate. So yeah. I'm, I'm asking here, sure. but for an outsider looking in, it almost seems yeah. like you almost have to, it's like the grief is double for yeah. someone in that situation. Cause not only did you lose someone, but that someone hurt somebody else that caused them to mm. be gone. Their life, yeah. So it's like you almost are having to grieve for not just you, but also like mm -hmm. the other family yeah. in essence. It, it seems like to me. Yeah. No, you're right. Exactly. Yeah. There's the suicide loss and the loss of your person, just the loss of your person, regardless of how they died. Just losing yeah. your person is bad enough for them. <laughs> The method, you know, um, it, it, it compounds it. So the loss by suicide is is horrible. And then um, and then there's the murder part. You know, there's this this loss of this other life and, and that your person was responsible for, for oh, doing. Yeah. Um, so there's it's very layered and complicated. And, uh, you know, we talk I'm about sure. all of that in the group, <laughs> about all of those, you know, those things, those components. And um, there's so many different stories. There's so much variety with us, even just within our, our group probably have, you know, at least 20 or so survivors that kind of you know, have, have joined or have been in the group or come and go. Not everybody comes to every meeting, but um, we're getting some bigger meetings lately because we've had a lot of growth. Um, but the variety is so amazing, you know, of circumstances and yeah, uh, sure. relationships and connections and stuff. And um, But there's so much universality even within that of the things that we experience and feel that, you um, that's what really helps with the healing part is that we're, you know, absolutely we feel much less alone when we have each other to talk to. And we can understand that like, Oh, this is normal for, for this kind of loss or for, you know, um, sure. for grief in general, like just, just being able to share um, what we're going through um, and the things that have helped us helps. and the things you know, <laughs> um, that have hurt sometimes too, sometimes sharing that, is helpful, you know, um, and understanding that like, okay, yes, people are really ignorant about how to speak about grief. There's a lot of grief illiteracy and um, sometimes Thank it's you. helpful. You said it. I was going to get to that later, yeah. but you said it. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's really helpful to talk to other survivors and be like, oh my gosh, someone said the stupidest thing to me, you know, yeah. and just to be able to get that off your chest is, is helpful sometimes as well. And we talk about ways as a group to, um, to be there to support other survivors. We, we're not just wanting to be there and like every time just just there to rehash our story over and over again, although that's kind of part of the process, you know, is sharing our stories and saying the names of the people that we've lost. Um, yes. I think that's helpful as well. But um, a lot of us in the group really have a heart for um, for helping other survivors um, and, and for prevention as well, as much as we can. I mean, there's only so much you can do to prevent something sure. like this. But uh, <laughs> we definitely want to be there for those um that are left behind, you know, and let people know that, um, you know, that there are some resources and that we're trying to build more resources. That's a goal of one of, of our group is to kind of um, also be an action group, not just um, a group where we just, just talking. Talk. Or we um, yeah, and, and that's certainly important. But um, a lot of us really want to do something, you know, we want Absolutely. to be able to, like, um, make meaning out of our experience. Not that we, you know, find that there's like meaning in their death or whatever, you know, like there, we wish that never happened, and it shouldn't have, but it did. So what we have to do now going forward is make meaning with our own lives and with the memories and experiences we had with our loved one and um, try to find ways to, um, you know, um, incorporate all that we've learned and experienced um, 
into our own um, new path in life because you know, there's that before and after. It's like we can't go back to who we were before. We're going to be a new person. It's and, a new person. Yeah. And, Absolutely. And to learn how to, um, you know, incorporate and um, integrate all of that into our new lives. No matter yeah. how much we wish we didn't have to, um, if we want to, um, you know, to have lives of, of meaning and purpose, then it's important that we, that we do that. Yeah, absolutely. And my sister from another mister, Miriam, mm -hmm. she is a fellow caregiver to her mm -hmm. husband and brother. Mm -hmm. And uh, she mentioned uh, cherish the memories. Mm -hmm. uh, Miriam and I were talking mm -hmm. a couple days ago and she had um, figured out that we have some sim similarities between mm -hmm. our some of the the births and deaths of our mm -hmm. loved ones and like with dates and such, but mm -hmm. um, she actually, I posed a question to the audience mm -hmm. and I mentioned, has anyone ever experienced survivor's guilt? Because that's something that you mentioned mm -hmm. that I wanted to bring up. Um, and yeah. Miriam answered it and she said, um, not really guilt, but I did have questions for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, why did my mom have to lose three kids? Mm -hmm. yeah. How would my brothers look? What, what would my brothers look like today? Um, mm -hmm. They died before uh, she was born. Mm -hmm. um, is there something mm -hmm. I could have done to prevent my sister from dying? Um, Miriam opened up to me a couple days ago about her mother having some um, miscarriages and stillborn um, mm -hmm. children, I believe. Um, sorry if I misquoted that, Miriam, but um, th those are questions that, mm -hmm. you know, we we think about in hindsight. And thank you again, Sarah, for, um, mm -hmm. for sharing your story with us. I really appreciate that um, because it does show light on a whole portion that I don't really think about. Um, and I know some people are out there struggling with it, not just the suicide mm -hmm. part, but the suicide murder yeah. aspect. So thank you for being open with yes. us. Um, but yeah, definitely with the survivor's guilt, I don't yeah. know it. Maybe I did personally <laughs> deal mm -hmm. with survivor's guilt. Um, I think more so when my mm -hmm. grandfather recently passed here in May, mm -hmm. um, because my own husband has dealt with cancer. Mm -hmm. um, I was upset that maybe I didn't see signs. Like yeah. maybe we should have got him to the, the um, doctor sooner. Mm -hmm. And I know my mom, she, you know, her, with her dad, she has such, I don't think it's, I don't know if it's survivor's guilt or what, I don't want to speak. Um, mm -hmm out of turn for her, but I know she, she has those questions too. Like, mm -hmm. what if we would have got him to the doctor sooner? Would he have had an extra six months or mm -hmm. an extra year or, you know, those sort of things. But my first, I know you all have heard this before, mm -hmm. but my first um, major, um, I've, I've had grandmothers and grandfathers pass, but it wasn't, I, I was too young to grasp what it yeah. was until um, I was 25 and I lost my dad suddenly. Yeah. And I mean, doctors mm -hmm. were even baffled because of how healthy this guy was. And one day he just fell out and was gone before he hit the floor. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I dealt with people saying stupid things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I internalized all of it because I'm the strong one. So mm -hmm. um, I internalized all of that and he passed away Labor Day. So mm -hmm. we're rolling straight into the holidays mm -hmm. right after. Mm -hmm. My first everything was hard. Um, yeah. So he, he passed away Labor Day on Labor Day mm -hmm. 10 years ago. Then we rolled into, you know, uh, Thanksgiving. That was hard. My mom barely wanted to come out of her room. Mm -hmm. Um, then Christmas that, that was, I mean, we kind of sat around the table and just cried. We would eat and cry at the same time. You know, it was just, yeah. when I look at that, I, and I'm not laughing to like, 
I, that's my that's my coping mechanism is laughter. So forgive me if, yeah. if I seem out of turn, but that's my coping mechanism, y'all, is to laugh. But literally, like we would laugh, we would cry and eat, cry and eat. Yeah. Um, so it 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 sucked. Like mm -hmm. and I'm very open and honest about grief and my grief journey. Yeah. I didn't grieve my father until like five years after the fact, mm -hmm. and I don't suggest that for anybody right i in my head i imagined him because he um was always on the road for he was a financial advisor so he was always on the road meeting clients or trying to gain new clients so in my head i just said oh he's out on a business trip yeah he'll be back he's coming yeah. back so i just played that game with me in my mind constantly mm -hmm. so that the first thanksgiving and christmas was horrible yeah. for me on the inside, but I didn't let my grandma, so his mm -hmm. mom, I didn't let my mom see that, my brother see that. I tried my best to to hide and, and internalize all my feelings, mm -hmm. even despite the people saying, oh, since you're the oldest, now you got to mm -hmm. take up the mantle and, mm -hmm. um, oh, you know, how's your mom doing? How's your brother doing? Oh, they're good. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, where's my look after? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. like, I, cause I was just always seen as, as the strong one. I'm the oldest child. So I, of course I step into taking care of my mom and my brother. Mm -hmm. No one actually, um, you know, these are all feelings that I felt like I had to do mm -hmm for them just to get by, get through. Um, mm -hmm. Hey, Simone, I see that you're on too. Um, and she actually just said that uh, her mom passed two days before her birthday. So yeah. her birthdays have never been the same. Yeah, and I understand that. My brother passed <laughs> two days after my birthday. So my birthday is July 2nd. He died on July 4th. Um, so yes, I have that, you know, birthday anxiety kind of leading up to it. And then it's the anniversary and then it's the day I found out and then it's the funeral and, you know, like then it's his it's birthday and her so birthday. so much. And then, you know, yeah, it kind of, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a lot. It's so much to, to get through. And I have um, some very, very um, good friends. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if they're on right now, or they might catch the replay. Um, but they have recently lost, like one of my really good friends lost mm -hmm. their um, dad, another one lost their mom, mm -hmm. and another one lost their brother um, within mm -hmm. this past year. So they're all dealing, this is going to be their first mm -hmm. holi major holiday, mm -hmm. you know, the, the um, Christmas and Thanksgiving Christmas. season mm -hmm. um, that they're going to be without mm -hmm. that person. And um, that's really what truly sparked, other than my own grieving journey, mm -hmm. what sparked me to reach out to you to discuss this because yeah. the holidays can really, really be stressful yeah. and commanding of, I mean, <laughs> of all, of 100% of us. Mm -hmm. And um, for people that are trying to gain their footing try to figure mm -hmm. out how to even deal without that person even being here and then thrusting mm -hmm. them into the holidays. I really wanted to talk to you about, um, you know, how can we navigate our, our emotions, our, our thoughts through this time? Because it's hard, especially yeah. when you're sitting there, like my dad was always at the head of the table, mm -hmm. that head of the table, Ha has been empty for 10 years, for 10 Christmases, mm -hmm. for 10 Thanksgivings, because no one wants to sit there, right? It's awkward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how do we go through the the holiday season? How do we navigate these strange waters that we may find ourselves in as if it was our first holiday or mm -hmm. our 20th holiday without that, without you, without mm -hmm. that person, our person? Right. Yeah. These are, these are hard questions for sure. But, I mean, I'll do my best, but I, you know, of course I'm not an expert on anyone else's experience. I can just sure. talk from my own and from what I've, I've heard and learned and picked up, um, you know, that there's, there's no right way to get through the holidays. It's just, you just get through the holidays and, um, 
you know, there's a lot of expectation and um, stress, like you said, and, 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 um, ideas about how the holidays should be that everybody has and people like to tell us, <laughs> you know, what they think the right way is to do the holidays. Um, and, you know, even just even without the loss, you know, the, the holidays are hard for people and um, can bring up a lot and there can be a lot of family tension and dynamics going on and stuff. So, um, I just, we, we just have to realize that going in holidays are, are hard for everybody, but they're definitely much harder, you know, if you're, if you're grieving and especially if you've lost multiple people, which a lot of people, especially in the last couple of years with, with COVID and, um, just with everything going on in the world, you know, the craziness that we're living through right now, um, are, are, you know, have experienced a lot of times many losses and these things compound, you know, and you have this this buildup of grief. And it, it's really hard to know how to process that all. And, um, and what, what grief do you work on today? You know, is it this loss or that loss? Or, you know, like, oh, it's, it's definitely very, very difficult in the holiday seasons, you know, just, it just makes it harder, you know, especially um, if you live in a place where the weather is, is not very cooperative, you know, and if you have any sort of seasonal help. affective disorder or anything like that, like that can make it even worse because, you know, you're also just dealing with this physiological issues and stuff, you know, when, yeah. when the weather is, is difficult and it's dark and, and um, so we just need to do all that we can to kind of support ourselves um, and, and those that we love that are around us and ask for support too. Um, so <laughs> that's it. That's I wish a, I had a button for a round of applause. Yeah. I'll get into that a little <laughs> bit more, but um yeah, I mean, I think you can, it's going to be different. And you're going to have, I think we have to come to terms with that, that the holidays aren't going to be the same. Um, they're going to be different. And um, they're probably going to be difficult, or at least at times. But um, you can get through and you can find moments of, of goodness and moments of joy and, and moments of um, happy memories. Um, and those are the things that we kind of need to to cling to, you know, to get to the next moment. Um over time, as you know, you process the grief that you're that you're going through, and that you, um, and as you learn new coping skills, and find safe people um, that that you can lean on for support, um, you know, I think that you can get to a better place, and you can even enjoy the holidays again. And uh, that may sound kind of impossible right now if you're in the midst of you know deep grief, but. Um, just know, you know, that other, other people have, have done it. So there's hope. Um, if I can do it, you can do it, you know, um, but there's no time limit. There's no, Thank it's not you. a race. So you just take your own time and you just go at your own pace and, um, try to block out, you know, all the shoulds and stuff that other people are, are telling you or that you're telling yourself. I um, definitely want to highlight what you just said, Sarah, um, about the time limit. Mm -hmm. Um, since I've been more vocal about my, my, my grief journey and put myself out there in my book, um, I've had multiple people ask me, mm -hmm. well, how did you get to where you are now that you're comfortable talking about that day that your dad died or mm -hmm. um, all the events that has happened since then? And um, I want to get to that point. I can't tell you how to navigate your own grief journey per se, but I will tell you that you are on, on your own timeline. I can't tell you if it's going to take you a month, if it's going to take you 20 years. Mm -hmm. I can't be the one to tell you that, but, um, you know, there's been a couple of people that have asked me, well, tell me the steps that you took to get yeah. there. Cause I, I, I'm tired of feeling this pain when I wake up, I want to get there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my biggest piece of advice for people that are asking about how do I get to the other side, which mm -hmm. I don't per se believe there's the other side. Um, yes. There's just this. There's a better place, but maybe yes. not like, oh, I, because I'm, I'm totally exactly. better. I don't think I'm, this. <laughs> um, um, just to give you an example, my mom bought me this beautiful um sweatpant outfit mm -hmm. and it's just for you Sarah you might walk past it in Kohl's and be like oh that 
that's whatever and keep on walking. I cried. Okay. Mm -hmm. I cried yesterday mm -hmm. because it looks like something my dad would have worn. No. Yeah. 10 years, 10 yeah. years. He died 10 years ago and I still find little things to cry about. Yeah. But your love for him <laughs> goes on forever. I mean, yeah. There's and no that's what I said. On all that today. Well, there's no timeline on grief. Yeah. There's no timeline. You're yeah. going to always hear, smell, mm -hmm. see things that is you. Oh, hey, I want to call that person like right yeah. now. Um, or I wish they or, saw that. Or, they're hard, but it's beautiful too. I mean, yeah. those moments, it's like painful, but it also feels kind of good at the same time yes. because it reminds you that they're, they're not forgotten. You know, you, you love them. They're still part of you. They, there's still this connection and Absolutely. I wouldn't want those things to completely disappear. I hope that in 10 years or 20 years or whatever, I still have moments where I see something or hear something or smell something or remember something. Um, and think of my brother and, um, you know, I, I of course I, you know, I, I never want to forget, um, forget him or forget our love. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's really important to keep those things alive. And there are you, going to you have to live in them every day. You don't have to, you know, sit in that pain constantly. Like at some point, hopefully if you, you know, do, do the work of the grieving, um, you'll get to a place where you're, you know, it's not as heavy and it's not as painful or sharp all the time. Right. And you get to where you just, you know, you just have these moments every so often, you know, where, yeah. where it does hurt, but that just reminds you that you're alive and that they lived and that you love each other. And I think exactly. that's super important and it's not something I want to give up. You know, <laughs> I don't think I, I don't think um, it's fair for people to expect that, you know, we're just going to be over it at some point. And absolutely. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> so no. And um, I, I, I love that. And, and Miriam even said to uh, absolutely decide how long you need for the process. Yeah. Um, and I know for sure, Miriam, she wrote a book too about her caregiving experience, mm -hmm. but she took you back to her native country of Sarenim in the, the mm -hmm. first part of the book and described how she grew up with her mom and her dad and um, the connection she had with her mom. And mm -hmm. it's almost like you're standing there in the kitchen with her. And I know mm -hmm. as we wrote our book, cause we wrote our books almost together at the same mm -hmm. time. And she would tell me that she would recall those moments that she had with her mom, even though her mom's been gone longer than mm -hmm. I, I think, well, no, she lost her mom about the same time I lost my dad. So um, mm -hmm. there's, there's songs that I hear and I'm transported mm -hmm. back to, which I know you probably read my book by now. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm transported back to the, the car rides with my dad yeah. and I hope I never forget those, those yeah. moments. I truly cool. don't. And, and now navigating my first Christmas without my grandpa. Mm -hmm. um, Cause he, he loved, he loved coming over here for Christmas was mm -hmm. his, his thing. He loved seeing his grandkids his great grands, his, his, his um, daughters and son, like just live. And um, I know my mom took, she was his sole caregiver. Um, and she, I helped her where, where she needed me to, but she was in it. And yeah. I, um, I know navigating the holidays without her dad for yeah. the first time in over, 60 years is mm -hmm. going to be hard. Um, so I know as we get older, when we lose a loved one, it gets yeah. harder because we have so many memories built up, but I'm glad mm -hmm. that I have the bank of memories that I yeah. do. I was just thinking that exact term. I was just thinking you're building that, you build this big memory bank, you know, of, of memories yeah. and of, of moments. And, the, you know, that's, that's where we can, we can pull out those treasures, you know, when they're yeah. gone and, and, and look at them and feel them and think about them. And I think that's, um, that's really important as, as Miriam says, you know, the tre treasuring all the moments, you know, that's really, yes. that's really important. Um, and that's, that's how they live on, you know, our people live on because they live in our hearts and in our minds and our that. thoughts. Um, 
you know, when they're gone, their bodies are gone, their stuff is gone, you know, like, how else do they live? They live through us. And, um, and it's, it's our, you know, our precious duty to, to remember them and, and to, to think about them. And I love that. Um, but there, you know, there is going to be some pain that comes with that. And I, I, I will great, you know, gladly pay that, that cost to have, um, had him and to, um, you know, continue to have him in my life. It's, it's worth the yeah. pain um, of the grief um, because there's joy that comes with, with that too. And that those things are, you know, they're kind of, they seem to be like these contrary sort of emotions, these things, but they, they actually can really coexist and they do, you know, we can feel more than one emotion at once. Usually oh, we can feel these opposite things at the same time, you know, exactly. and, um, and just allowing ourselves to do that and not beating ourselves up because, you know, we're, we're, we're confused that, you know, we're feeling two things at once. It's okay. That's normal. That's just part of, um, of how our emotions, you know, work. And that's, exactly. that's, okay. that's why, I mean, I feel the term bittersweet a lot. I mean, I feel, um, that's the, the term I feel, um, about, um, you know, when I, when I think about my brother sometimes and, um, on, on the days, the anniversary dates and the birthdays and the holidays and stuff, it's, that's the, the main emotion I kind of feel is that bittersweetness, you know, um, the sadness that they're not with me, but the yes. sweetness that they were, um, you know, and trying to, to find that, that balance or trying to find things that, um, help counteract the sadness, you know, you need to uh, put that just, on a bookmark or a stick or something, Sarah, yeah. say that again, yeah. the, the bitter that they're not with us, but the sweetness, right, the sweetness that they, they were. were. Yeah. You need to put yeah. that on a bookmark, girl. <laughs> the, <laughs> I mean, that's how I felt on uh, the one year anniversary of my brother's loss is the day I actually created my grief connection. Um, I didn't I started, know that. Yeah. Yeah. So about three weeks before that, I was in a counseling session and I uh, was just complaining about how hard it was to find grief resources and support and groups and stuff and how there wasn't like a hub of uh, resources online I could go to to find that. I was having to search all over the place and then, you know, couldn't tell if this group was still active or not. You'd have to call or email and then you wouldn't get a response. And it was just oh, very goodness. frustrating. And so I was kind of complaining about that. And my counselor was like, well, uh, you're right. You know, it is very hard and there, you know, there's not enough resources out there, but maybe that's, um, maybe that's something that you could try to find a solution for. And I was like, what? Like, mm, I need, I'm the one that needs it, you know, like, why should I have to do that? You know, that labor to, to create yeah. this. Thing. But then I thought about it and she was right. And I realized, you know, nobody's running out there to like put this website up. And so if it's going to exist, I'm going to probably have to be the one that creates it you know i need I, I just wanted to have a place to, to help one person you know find find a good group or find the right counselor or something that's kind of what i was thinking like if that, that helps one person then it's worth it and it's something i could do to honor my brother and his fiance and um well both my brothers actually and um yeah. so i i ended up spending a like a six hour day in a in a cafe on the fourth of july and just cobbled together a website, you know, like, I don't know what I'm doing. I just sort of uh, pieced it together from um, some small experience I had, like kind of hosting a website for another group I'm in. And um, I just Googled and YouTube, like, how do I add a picture? How do I add a video and the link and all that? And I, I had something at the end of the day. So I hit publish and, and that's how it all started. Really. It was, wow. it was a way that I could do something to sweeten that day a little bit because it was such a hard day. Um, it was a way I could um, be active, you know, and and feel like I was producing something helpful that might help someone else. And the process of that helped me. And so that that's kind of where that term sort of came I from, you know, just like it, it, you know, it was how I made such a bitter day a little bit sweeter was by, by creating something out of love um, for someone I love. I love that. Yeah. So um, that's kind of how grief, my grief connection started. And it's just sort of snowballed from there. But And um, that's how a lot of good resources start yeah. is because yeah. someone couldn't find what they were looking for. So they said, well, yeah. I want to find it myself. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> I mean, that's what you did, too. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. I... I, I love this conversation and you hit on something else I wanted to bring up 
um, with the self care portion of it is sure. um, counseling and yeah. and therapy. Mm -hmm. um, I do write a whole <laughs> chapter about this in my book mm -hmm. um, about seeking therapy. So what what has it done for you? Like, do you yeah. suggest others that are on their grieving yeah. journey get a therapist? Because I know I do. Yeah. I mean, I'm a big fan of therapy. I'm a, I make, I'm in school <laughs> to learn how to do it. So, um, you don't, you know, I love, I love therapy for sure. Um, I, yeah, I found a therapist about three months after Sky died. I mean, I, I finally allowed myself permission to get some help, um, yes. which is probably something I should have done before Sky died. Like I had, a, you know, a, a pretty good life, I, you know, not, Anything I th felt was like, oh, I, I didn't have any of these like huge major traumas and stuff from childhood. But now I realize I did have some of that. I just didn't recognize it. Um, but then I kind of thought like, oh, you know, like I shouldn't take up a therapist's time. Like I don't really have anything that bad going on in my life, you know, I hear you. like um, but I, I knew I could benefit from it. I just was I don't know, just I never kind of took that step. And then I had this horrible thing happened and I finally felt like I had permission, you know, that I had a big enough thing <laughs> to see, seek help for. So um, in a lot of ways, my brother's death was, has been a blessing to me. And I know that sounds weird and I don't mean I'm glad he's dead. I'm just, I hear I, you. I, I just you. have had opportunities that have happened after he died. Um, I see the world in a different way and I allowed myself to see myself in a different way than I had before because of this, if that makes sense. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I allowed myself to kind of seek help because I felt like, oh, this is a big enough trauma now. I finally deserve to get some help for this. And so um, I got very lucky and ended up, uh, I mean, I think I know it was a God thing. It's lots of it's a long story behind it, but I found this amazing therapist and she actually worked in an office building, like literally just steps away um, on the same block where I worked and she worked evenings and Saturdays, which is what I needed. I was really struggling to find someone that had the right time, you know, that I could go. So I could literally clock out and walk across the block and go to my therapy appointments after work. And I would, I started out going like two or three times a week for several months, probably six or eight months. I was, I was there. I was dedicated. I was like, look, I need help with this. And then as I started working on the grief, I realized I had other issues underlying that, you know, and grief from childhood and from Stephen's death and from other things that I didn't realize were there. And, um, and I just, you know, it was so helpful and healing and I've just made huge progress. And I mean, it's really because I went into counseling that I was able to get to a point where I could start my grief connection, where I could even have the thought that that's something I could maybe do, you know, and the, and the fact that I'm in counseling and grad school right now, all of that has to do with the work I've done um, on myself through my counseling experience. And so I'm definitely a huge fan. Um, it, it's important to find the right counselor, you know, the one that is a good fit for you. And um, I, I got lucky and got the, a great one, like right off the bat, the first time I went to counseling and I've been with her ever since. So I've been doing counseling for almost three and a half years now. Um, now I only go like once a week usually, but, um, I, you know, I would go more if I could, but sometimes life is just busy, <laughs> you know, but, um, I, I found it so, so beneficial and, um, definitely highly recommend it, especially if, if you're experiencing a traumatic loss, um, uh, you know, not everybody needs to go to counseling for grief. A lot of times um, it, it's grief is just a natural process that we go through, you know, when we lose someone, it's the, it's, it's, it's not abnormal. And so it's not a pathology or anything like that. You know, you don't have to, to immediately run to a counselor um, when you lose someone. But um, if, you know, you find that after a little bit of time, you know, you're really struggling and, um, uh, or you just need someone to talk to, like, it's totally fine at any stage in your grief journey to get help, whether it's right away, whether it's years down the line, it's okay. And, um, you know, at different times, grief is going to come up in different ways. Um, the layers, you know, <laughs> might, might show up differently. So I feel like, you know, just give yourself that gift if you're able to, and if it feels like something that seems right to you, um, it's, it's definitely been super helpful for Absolutely. me. Absolutely. 
All right, and I want to piggyback off of that because, uh, Miriam, if you're still on, uh, we highly encourage, uh, and if any of the caregivers are listening um, from my support group, uh, we highly encourage uh, any and every of our fellow caregivers to mm -hmm. speak up and ask for help. Yeah. Um, and I like how you say give that as a gift to yourself. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's truly self-care mm -hmm. <laughs> to receive yeah. um, help in that capacity, especially yeah. with your own mental health, because, yeah. you know, when um, I've been in the midst of this cancer battle with my, my husband, and that's mm -hmm. all we've known. We've only yeah. known fight, 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 fight. Mm -hmm. And now that we can kind of uh, relax a little bit, it's like, okay, so yeah. where where do we go he from here? Well, mm -hmm. that's when we decided to to seek out some some help because mm -hmm. all we know is fight. We want to know how to be kind of normal, even though we're not normal mm -hmm. people. <laughs> <Who is? laughs> um, yeah, we yeah. want to know what what marriage should look like without us fighting. A yeah. deadly cancer diagnosis. Yeah. So, um, and right. as we're talking to the therapist, she kind of keeps looking at me like, there's some things maybe you still need to work out on your dad's mm -hmm. death. And I'm like, mm -hmm. huh? No, ma'am, we're not here for, for me. Like, that's yeah. been a while ago. I don't need, you know, yeah. to, to worry about that. But it's so true. Like, the, the things... Um, that I hadn't worked through mm -hmm. were still affecting me. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, so grief is just this long course mm -hmm. that you're, you're going through mm -hmm. and there's no time limit limit. It shouldn't be, there's no like, mm -hmm. okay, six months from the person passing, you don't cry anymore. Right. Or you, you stop posting about them on Facebook or mm -hmm. it doesn't look like that. Like you yeah. still love that person. You know, I still see some of my, um, mm. some of my friends that post, like they lost their parent way younger than me. And mm -hmm. it was like 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. It's not, oh, it's not like it's over and done with. You still miss yeah. that person. Yeah. So um, I just know I, for me, uh, therapy was, was, uh, That's was really good. Um and I know there's even a bigger stigma in the African American mm -hmm. community because yeah. we've been told to go to church and pray about it. Yeah. And going to church and praying about it is great, but I also need some help. Like yes. I the tangible <laughs> yeah. tools and tips and <laughs> yes. I need yeah. to also there's something called spiritual bypassing. I don't know if you've heard that term before, but that's kind of when we put the spiritual band-aid on something like that, like a wound. Um we we say, you know, we just give that, you know advice about, you know, read your Bible, that's if, you have your faith, if you pray more, if you, you know, ask for healing, if, you know, if you're a better Christian um, or a believer or whatever, then, um, you know, you should be able to kind of get over this without, you know, outside help or spiritual whatever. It's called spiritual bypass. bypassing. Yes. Where you kind of get around the thing something new by putting a spiritual like bandaid on it, you know, or, or trying to kind of give it the spin of like, you know, it's, it's your faith. That's the problem. You know, if you had strong, more faith, you'd be, you'd be fine. Um, and, and oh. not realizing that like, hello, we're, we're actual human beings with, um, with brains, <laughs> you know, that, that are, you know, like this, this physical thing, you know, it's part of our body. So we have this physical body mm -hmm. and, um, you know, we have, emotions and, and, um, you know, things going on physically that affect how we feel. Yeah. And you can't just, you know, pray your way out of that sometimes, you know, sometimes there's, there's more involved and we need help. Um, we need mental health help. We need physical help, you know? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. It, yeah. It's, that's an interesting term that I, that I learned a couple of few years ago and, and it's something that I think, um, a lot of people don't know that term, but that's really what happens no. a lot of times, is that we yeah. try to get around things by using this, these spiritual, you know, excuses or reasons or beliefs or whatever that like, yeah. you know. And don't get me wrong. I grew up in the church. Like my dad was an ordinary minister, but <laughs> I, I know I remember because your parents were uh, missionaries, right? Missionaries and pastors. Yeah. yeah. So um, I grew up with that too. So I'm like, 
but still i need someone yeah. physically that went to school for this stuff to listen mm -hmm. to me yeah. and guess what they're getting paid to listen to me run my mouth about yes. me so mm -hmm. hello who do i sign up to go see and they're <laughs> unbiased you know the the professional counselor you know should be unbiased and they should be able to like listen and empathize and validate you know and and then also help give you tools and resources yes. as well sure. and you know you can't i mean people some people think oh, i'll just talk to my friends and family but there's a limit there's a capacity that your friends and family have to listen to those things and they are also often dealing with that same issue or their some own. you know the same kind of loss and their own stuff going on with it um and sometimes it feels you know, sometimes we can feel like we're a burden or adding to the burden of our family and friends who are maybe also grieving by by sharing everything. And there's certain things maybe we just don't have anyone that feels like the right person that we can share with some of those sure. details. Um, I mean, you know, I, I, I certainly talk with my parents and my brother and my friends about things, but there are certain things that, uh, you know, I don't really have anywhere for it to go, you know, and um, my counselor is that person, you know, that can be there and listen to all of that. And um, you know, the things that I might feel um, hesitant to talk about with anyone else or embarrassed about um, admitting, you know, yes. like, she can take it and she there's, and and there's no judgment and she doesn't judge. Um, but she can also give me some perspective, you know, uh, help me see things in a way I, I wouldn't be able to see them otherwise. So, uh, yeah, I definitely, definitely feel like, you know, counseling is a great thing. Um, and I know it's hard to afford for everybody. So, um, I have a lot of resources on my website um, that can help Good. people find counselors. There's actually a little guide they can download about how to find a grief Good. counselor. And um, and there's also a lot of information about um, therapy directories out there where you can search to find somebody. There are um, actually um, several different organizations now that um, like our nonprofits that offer counseling for, for free or low cost in certain for certain people of certain categories, like people that are healthcare workers that are, you know, dealing with COVID-19 grief and those kind of things. Um, there's um, also a lot of um, therapists and will offer uh, discounted like a sliding scale um for fees um and there's also a lot of places that have master's level interns that are doing um their internship or their practicum oh, yeah. and they offer counseling sometimes for 15 20 25 dollars a session and so um you know that's that's great they're supervised so they they are you know it's it's safe. Right. um they have someone there that that is helping them so I would definitely look into that if it's if you're really interested in counseling but are struggling with the financial part, maybe you don't have insurance or whatever. I know if you have Medicaid, Medicaid actually does cover a lot of mental health um, costs and a lot of counseling and um, peer support and things like that. So um, definitely look into it and make sure that you understand you know what your what your coverage um, can get you because you might not be utilizing it. Um, sure. And if you at your work, sometimes your work might offer an EAP, which is an um, employee um, assistance program. And a lot of those will offer um, support for, for grief and loss and all kinds of other mental health kind of uh, things under that umbrella. And um, a lot of times you can get like five or six free counseling sessions through your EAP. Um, so definitely look into that because there are options out there. And there are also even just like listening lines. I know in my crisis help page there's um the listening line is listed listed on there it's a free number you can call and there's trained peer support people awesome. on the other end 24 7 and you can just call if you just need someone to talk to you know That's maybe true. maybe you don't need a counselor per se but you just kind of are having a hard time and need someone to talk to those things are great and even your local um suicide prevention hotline um you don't have to be in a suicidal crisis to call um if you're really struggling and you just need someone to talk to, you can actually call a hotline as well. And as long as they're not busy with crisis stuff, usually they can talk to you for a little while or give you some other resources as well. So um, don't just suffer, you know, in right. silence. Um, re and I've out. posted her website below, yeah. guys. Yeah. Sarah's uh, My Grief Connection website is in the, the comments yeah. and it's scrolling underneath our names yeah. now. Um, so you guys can go to her website to to find these resources, mm -hmm. please. So, yeah. Sarah, what does um, 
your self-care look like during the holidays as we wrap up here? Well, I mean, my self-care maybe is just a little amped up <laughs> from normal, but it's pretty much kind of the same sort of things that I, I usually do for self-care. I try to be um, on top of that. It's a little harder now that I'm in school, you know, the busyness of that sometimes to be as consistent, but um, I do really try to be gentle on myself. I'm not always the best with that. I do have a pretty rough inner critic that likes to, you know, beat me up sometimes, but I'm, that's something I'm actively really working on um, is changing that, uh, the voice of my inner critic, you know, and, and being kinder and more compassionate to myself. Um, so self-compassion is a huge thing. That's probably the number one thing that we should all be working on. Um, and not to shit on you, but you know, like that I recommend that we all right. be working on. Uh, there's a great book called Self-Compassion, The Proven Power of Being Kind to Yourself uh, by Kristen Neff. And uh, she's actually- um, Oh, I've talked with that, her. Yeah, she, she's a researcher that studies self-compassion and she's just um, wonderful and got some amazing um, information out there. And if you, if you don't like to read, just look her up on any of the podcasts um, you know, platforms that you're on, type in Krista Neff or self-compassion, you'll find interviews with her. Um, so she's, she's great and gives a lot of um, wonderful advice. And I mean, I, I, I like to do things, just try to take some quiet time, try to rest more, um, you know, try to eat well and, and stay hydrated, like just keeping on top of like taking care of your physical uh -huh. body is really important. Um, you know, try to get good sleep. Um, I do struggle with that sometimes getting to bed early enough, and, you know, so but I, I, I'm really working to, to do that. Um, you know, if you're having sleep problems, you know, um, you might consider also seeing a sleep doctor, um, or getting a sleep test or whatever, because I, I know I have sleep apnea, so I have to use a CPAP machine. And if I don't, I just do not sleep well at all. So just, um, you know, take some time to kind of, um, uh, do a little investigating on how you can improve your sleep hygiene and, sure. um, and things that you can do to kind of um, help yourself get more rest. Um, you know, things like taking hot Epsom salt baths. Um, hot showers. You know, hot showers are great. Um, <laughs> I, you know, moving your body in ways that feel good. I love to dance. I actually do an adult ballet class once a week, which I love. And um, and that also gets me with other people that are interested yeah. in something I'm really interested in. So I've made some great friends there and, and that's super supportive. Um, I like to go for walks and do some stretching, things like that. Um, it doesn't have to be difficult. It just be easy, you know, even five, 10 minutes, <laughs> it's just yeah. do something um, that, that gets your blood moving is, is helpful. And, and breathing, you know, deep breathing helps. Um, a lot of people like to do uh, meditation. There's actually lots of apps that can help you with, um, with meditating and breathing and, and things like that. I love the abide app because it's, um, it's a faith-based kind of Christian based, um, based oh. uh, meditation app. And so it's based on scripture and stuff. And for me, that, that just is, um, what I enjoy the most. And they have actually sleep meditations that I, I use to help me sleep. So, um, that's, that's one I enjoy a lot. Um, also getting massage or body work or yes, um, energy work or things like that can be very helpful. Um, I know I hold a lot of tension in my neck and, and shoulders. Yes. And so, um, any kind of, touch physical touch that's comforting it can also just be touching yourself just putting your hands on your chest and taking some deep breaths or holding your face you know or putting your hands on your neck or just just taking a moment it doesn't have to take long it can just be a few seconds but just when you're feeling tension and stress just take a moment put your hands on yourself take a few breaths maybe say a little prayer or whatever even just that kind of thing can really help um and if you're a writer or journaler, like journaling can be super helpful or writing letters to your loved one Absolutely. Um, or writing letters to yourself. You know, I do that sometimes. I've written letters to my my former self, my past self or my future self. Um, and, and those things can be helpful, too, to help you kind of just work through stuff and um, listen. You know, listening to music can be great for if you like it, if you're a music person, just anything that you enjoy doing, you know, making art. I love to color. I like to blow bubbles. I like to, um, <laughs> you know, um, I like to uh, do crafting, all of that kind of stuff. So anything that um, gives you a little break, <laughs> um, lets you decompress a little bit, like lets you let a lot of steam and relax. Those are, those are very helpful. 
um, things. Crying, I find, is actually a good self-care technique. Allowing myself time to cry, you know? Yeah. Um, you can, you might be able to just set aside time for a good cry fest or like watch a movie that, you know, like gets you every time. And, and that might allow you to sort of let those tears flow. Tears can be very cleansing and healing. Absolutely. Um, and I try not to repress it, you know, when it comes up just in everyday life. I mean, sometimes tears come up at inconvenient times, so that's hard. But um, if, if, <laughs> if they come up at a time when I can or when I feel, you know, safe enough or comfortable enough, I just I just let them come, you know. Um, and I think it really, really helps. Um, there's definitely like a physiological release. Oh, with- absolutely. Because it's almost like the, the pent up. <laughs> or emotions that you don't know how to convey sure. but they come out in those tears and, yeah. and like you said it's so cleansing it's just like yeah. oh i finally got rid of it you know yeah, uh, yeah there's so stress absolutely. hormones that we release through tears so oh, um, absolutely yeah so. they're cleansing for sure I mean, you know, even just also like asking for hugs, <laughs> offering and asking for hugs, that can be a very self-care thing to do as well. Um, I think just requesting <laughs> what you need uh, anytime is a is an act of self-care. Absolutely. Um, I agree. You know, um, and people <laughs> really want to be there for you. I, I'm sure most of your friends and family are happy to help. And often they ask, like, let me know what I can do. How can I help? You know, tell me if there's something I can do. And it's hard sometimes in the moment, like right then to think of it. But when you do have time and something comes up, um, I think, you know, it's helpful to just let them know and say, hey, you know, when you offered to <laughs> to help, I was wondering if you could come, you know, yeah. with my dog or whatever, you know, whatever it is, because most people would be thrilled and it gives them an opportunity to do something to support you. And oftentimes they just don't know what to do. And um, um, they can't really know unless you express Tell them. that, you know, there's so much else too. I think planning ahead is important. Um, I mean, these are just some general tips for the holidays, I think, uh, that I'd, I'd love to share real quickly. But, you know, planning ahead can lower your stress. Make a plan A and then make a plan B and C <laughs> because you may not feel like doing plan A when it comes around. You know, trying to be flexible and allowing yourself flexibility and the um, permission to change your mind. Um because grief can show up in weird times and unexpected ways. And you just have to leave space for that and just know, like give yourself margin, you know, um, so in your life so that, you know, you can go with it when you need to. Um, and I think it's important to discuss those needs, you know, with your family and friends as you can. And you might have to make some compromises about what things you're going to do over the holidays yeah. and you pick and choose um, because you need to protect your space and your time and your energy. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And managing your expectations, um, you know, knowing what your limitations are and what your boundaries are is really important. Giving yourself permission to say no to things Those and boundaries. Um, to, you know, if you want to attend events, that's great. That can be helpful. That can be distracting, which is good, you know, at times. Um, but allowing yourself that exit strategy and that um, permission to leave early. Um, I was just going to say that. Yes. Yeah. And, um, just, you know, just doing what you feel seems manageable and doable and what feels good and then do less of what feels bad or what feels overwhelming. If it feels overwhelming, then probably um, cut that out or cut it down or scale it back. Um, maybe skip decorations or skip cards or skip cooking or, you know, like <laughs> gifts, like, you know, or make it simple. Just simplify, I think, is a huge thing to getting through the holidays without being like completely overwhelmed. Um you know, and then trying to kind of give up um, listening to all the shoulds and the should nots, um, both from others and yourself, you know, just doing what's right for you um, and your family, regardless of what other people think. I know that's hard because there's a lot of expectation and social, you know, pressure, but, um, you know, we, we deserve, we deserve that. We deserve to um, do what's right for us. And it's, it's what we need to do to protect our, ourselves and our hearts and our, um, and our energy levels. So try not to compare, you know, what you did with before, uh, with what you're able to do now, because those are going to be different things <laughs> and Absolutely. it's okay to let go of all that you did before and say, okay, now I'm going to start with a clean slate and I'm going to pick the things that mean something to me. I'm going to pick whatever the traditions are, 
that um, that give me comfort and hope and that feel good. And I'm going to let go of anything, any of the traditions or expectations that don't. Um, you know, you don't have to do the holidays the same way as you did before. And we probably shouldn't, you know, um, or, or we don't, we just don't yeah. have to, you know, um, you can do something totally unholiday ish if you want to, you know, you can change it up. You can go out of town. You can take a vacation. You I can, was going to say for the past <laughs> 10 yeah. years, I can't remember the last time we were actually in my hometown for Christmas. Yeah. Because it just hasn't been the same since, since without yeah. my dad. So we just travel on Christmas. Yeah. I think that's a great option. Um, and then, you know, you could, you can order out, you know, you can get pizza, you can have Chinese food or tacos or do, do something completely different. You don't have to have the traditional Christmas dinner yep. unless you want to. Um, a lot of people like to, and then they make special foods that, that were their loved ones favorites. You know, um, we do, sometimes we'll do like biscuits and gravy for Christmas morning because that's something that my brother really loved and it was a special thing. Um, or, um, you know, um, I don't know, like you, you can pick, you know, maybe there's a special meal. Maybe it's not on the actual holiday, but like on Christmas Eve, you do like, you know, their favorite, like lasagna or something, or you can, you can make a, a special moment of it, a special um, event of, of maybe putting together like all of their favorites into something, or maybe they love to play games and you have like a game night and you eat their favorite food or what, whatever, if that feels good to you, it may not feel good to some people that may be too much. And that may be sure. too much this year. Maybe next year you could try that. Um, you know, you could go to the movies or go bowling or just do something completely different. Um, you can you can skip putting up the tree and the decorations if you want to. Um, I know we did that the first year. My parents just were not up for putting up a tree and, and doing all the decorations. So uh, we put maybe one or two small things out that were meaningful, um, like a nativity set and some stuff like that. Maybe a couple little twinkle light things. But we just weren't you know, feeling that festive and that's, that's fine. That's fine. Um, you know, you can have pajama day or game day or something like that on, on the holiday and you can just pretend it's just a, another, a, a day off, you know, and you don't have to kind of get sucked into all the holiday stuff. Um, you could also volunteer um, your time uh, at a shelter or a community organization. You could serve food. You know, you could do something for others. And sometimes that helps us get our mind off of the pain that we're in. If we kind sure. of help serve others and lessen their pain, um, you can donate in your loved one's name, um, money, time, um, gifts. I know some some families that will like, you know, um, pick out some gifts and donate them um, to a family in need or give a special gift um, that maybe, maybe something that you would have bought for your loved one that they would have liked, find someone else that maybe mm -hmm. would really enjoy that thing and gift that to them. I um, like that. Yeah. Just, um, Oh, and one other thing I like to do too, that I started um, the year after my brother died, died doing as a, as a tradition is um, there. Are, I didn't know about this until, until after he died, of course, but there are a lot of churches and, um, and organizations that do like a blue Christmas or a service um, of lament. Um, and I, I found in my area, there are several churches that have this kind of um, blue Christmas service or the service of the month. They call it, you know, either one. And it's it's a time. It's a special service for grievers to go and no way. have time to remember and honor and think about their loved ones and um, to l lament is a thing, you know, that. Um, people sometimes forget <laughs> that is good to do. You know, we, we, we need to allow ourselves times to lament and to grieve and to process. And um, I just think um, that for me has been a very special thing I've done every uh, Christmas for the last three years is find a service of lament or a blue Christmas service in my area. So you can hmm. Google, you know, those terms in your area and you'll probably find a local church that's doing it. I've, uh, a lot of times on Facebook, they'll have, you know, their event page on there for a service. I know there's one actually tonight in Boise at one of the churches. Um, so um, just something that maybe you haven't heard of before, but could be no. really helpful, especially if, if um, you know, you're a spiritual person or your faith is really um, something that you lean on, that that can oh, yeah. be um, a good opportunity. Because sometimes, sometimes our, our church communities and our, our spiritual communities 
um, God bless them. They try, but sometimes they're not that great. They kind of hit, <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> support, you know, they do that spiritual bypassing thing. So this is kind of a chance to sort of, um, kind of, um, uh, repair that a little bit maybe, or, or just, um, allowing us to kind of, um, use our spiritual sort of, um, tools and, yeah. and our selves to kind of uh, allow ourselves that time for some lament and and grief and and healing in that way I don't know if that makes sense that wasn't very yeah no no it does and yeah. i've i've never heard of that that that's awesome mm -hmm. i know um the funeral home that uh buried both my mm -hmm. dad and my grandfather they offer some kind of like a what do they call it? Like a like a grief. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, what what is it? Memory a memory celebration. Oh, and yeah. it's, it's near Christmas time, um, yeah. but I've never heard that term, Blue Christmas. So I yeah. I I think that's yeah. really um, neat. Um, that that's even mm -hmm. something that could be offered to local communities for mm -hmm. grievers to take part of because I know mm -hmm. a big reason why a lot of grievers, yeah. let me just speak for myself, why I <laughs> internalize a lot of my emotions is because I didn't know where to turn mm -hmm. to. So the more we talk about these resources yeah. um, is great because I'm sure mm -hmm. I'm not the only one that's never heard of Blue Christmas Church yeah. service term so um yeah. i did post that in the comments too so you guys can google see for your yeah. your area um if if yeah. there's any church service that's that's offered at. you know and if there isn't in your area you could do kind of your own little um maybe you know family moment or, or something uh, you know you could take some time to kind of have um maybe just do uh, a little candle lighting with your family members. Oh, yeah. Have a prayer, say a blessing, give a toast, um, share memories. Um, you could you could have your own little blue Christmas kind of service with your family. I love that. Um, and uh, you know you can you can have a reading, do some poetry, yeah, you know, read a poem or read a verse or two, um, anything like that. You know that kind of helps you sort of mark the moment and um, yeah. gives you that that space to sort of. Um, feel those feelings, you know, and to, to honor them and to remember them. I think that's really helpful. Um, a lot of people also, you know, will do things like, um, you know, buy or make a special ornament for their tree um, or, or do like a candle lighting, light a candle at the table, you know, <laughs> in, the, in the spot where their person would sit or um, sure. have that, that empty chair, that place setting, that kind of a thing to, to sort of honor them and remember them. Um, sometimes that's helpful for people. Sometimes that may be more painful. I, you know, you have to decide for yourself which, what, which of these kind of yeah. things um, feel right. Sure. So, um, Absolutely. That's the key is, is just customizing um, your, that's your holiday happened. experience oh, yes. so that you can get through it, um, that. in the way that works for you. And it's going to probably be different every year. So, um, I think we have to let go of those expectations that Christmas should always be exactly the same. And like, we should have all of these traditions I and mean, they should never change. Um, that's just not realistic for most people. And it's not, and life doesn't stay stagnant yeah. either. Right. Life, life is continually changing and exactly. we have to change with it. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, mm -hmm. sometimes <laughs> yeah. it's hard, but, yeah. uh, just walking and working through my, with, within my own grief journey, I just know that's like, it, it is a fact, like yeah. we, we have to walk through it, um, and know, just know that we have to ask for help if we feel mm -hmm. like we need it. Um, mm -hmm. also your grief journey is not my grief journey is not my right. mother's grief journey is not yeah. my grandmother's grief journey. So the sooner you can get that through mm -hmm. your, your head, you'll be light years ahead because I looked to the left, I looked to the right and I yeah. got discouraged because, you know, Susie was, mm -hmm. you know, doing all the things and I just feel like mm -hmm. staying in bed today. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it may look like that. Other times, um, like I said, 
my coping mechanism is laughter. So a lot of times people didn't even realize I was grieving because I tend to be smiley, hyperactive and other things come to find out that is also a sign of depression. So Mm -hmm. depression can look like a lot of different things. Grieving can look like a lot of different things, guys. So just um, be aware of that. Be kind to one another. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, it, it cracks me up because on Thanksgiving day, we will be sitting at the table thanking everybody. And the next day we mm-hmm. might push somebody out because we want <laughs> right. to do Xbox. Just please be, <laughs> please be nice. Or they cut us off in traffic or something like yeah. that. Please um, be guilty. nice. Um, be nice at all times, but especially yeah. in this yeah. season that we are in yeah. because it is hard especially for our first time uh yeah. grievers um and yeah, and we anyone. Have to give ourselves permission to have fun too and to have experience joy and not feel guilty about that right that's just important to keep in mind as well it's okay to enjoy the holidays you you know some people might have a really hard time with it and some people might not and that's okay too you know um and some years it might be hard and some years it might not be so um just yeah that comparison yeah. thing i think is really what gets us caught up a lot of the time when we Every compare time. to our ourselves and um we compare to other people um that's that's where we sometimes start to beat ourselves up and that's not helpful um you're you right know, have that patience <laughs> and, and that comfort that, that that compassion for yourself and you know and allow yourself to to enjoy the things you enjoy and have um also, you know, allow yourself to to hurt when you hurt, <laughs> and that's okay. Yeah, absolutely, it's just part of the process. Yeah. So, do you have any last um, yeah. notes or <laughs> quote or anything that you would like to leave us with? I really enjoyed our talk. I could go thank on you. and on about this topic. Yeah. Um, so I just want to be cognizant of your time because I know you were already a part of one yeah. um, meeting today. So thank you for coming to to this yeah. one as well. But any last words you have for us? I mean, I just I think I I kind of said it before, but like you know, just just be extra gentle and kind to yourself and and to others. You know, we we need to have grace for others as well, because oftentimes others don't really know how to support us in the way that we need to, if we especially if we haven't told them. Um, so learning to speak up for ourselves and our needs um, is really important. And I really encourage you to do that. And, and um, you know, try not to compare, try not to shit on yourself and um, just really allow for um, for whatever way the holidays um, play out um, to, to, to happen, you know, and just yeah. allow yourself the grace that you need to get through and um, really, you know, pat yourself on the back when you, when you do, <laughs> you know, let you be, be grateful, but also just, you know, you can, you can give yourself um, credit for getting through the holidays um, in whatever way, mm-hmm. You had to, you know, um, exactly give yourself full permission to do it your way. And um, I mean, I think that's the the key is to to just allowing and um, accepting what happens and um, and giving yourself grace and, and and comfort, being there for yourself, being an advocate for your needs Um and, you know, just reminding people that there there is hope that we can get to a better place and there's no race or rush to that, although it feels like it sometimes that feels like an urgent thing because you just want to feel better. But um, but it will come. It will come with time. It does come with some work. It does take some effort mm-hmm. um, <laughs> to try to not be afraid of that, you know, because um, it feels very vulnerable and scary <laughs> to 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 face um, these feelings that don't feel um, always very good. Um, yeah. But there's a, there's a payoff in the end, you know, there's, <laughs> you, you can get to that better place. There's um, room for healing and um, there's hope for um, post-traumatic growth and, um, and personal growth and change. And uh, I, I know I found those, for me and if that gives you a little hope to to hold on to that other people um 
have done have done it, um, then then hold on to that. You know that that's fine. Good. And I just want to wish everyone just a gentle holiday season. You know, um, I just I know it can be really hard, and I'm sorry that you are having to go through this. And um, you know, um, I'm here with you. <laughs> um, you're not alone, and and you can do this. Thank you, Sarah. And I did post. Um, again, in the comments where you can find Sarah, her yeah. website, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, email, all of the things. Um, yeah. You guys, I, have, I haven't had the pleasure of physically meeting Sarah yet. Um, one day soon, yeah. Um, yeah. But um, she has been um, a great person that I have gotten in contact with mm -hmm. and have formed a um, friendship with. Mm -hmm. She um, is the real deal uh, mm -hmm. about all things grief. And I wish her all the success that she, um, as she is going through her, with her further education, you are going to help so many people as you have already done. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you so much, Sarah, for telling your story and being open about it. Um, I'm sure you've changed one person's thinking today. So thank you again. And I just want to leave um, everyone with, because you said all the things about <laughs> dealing with with uh, the, the holidays, uh, dealing with grief during the holidays. So mm -hmm. I just want to end with a quote that I actually start my book with um, because it was so profound for me and is exactly mm -hmm. how I felt about grief. Um, so it is by Rose Kennedy, which I'm sure a lot of people might have heard this, mm -hmm. um, this quote before. But Rose Kennedy said, it has been said, time heals all wounds. Mm -hmm. I do not agree. The wounds remain in time, mm -hmm. the mind protecting mm -hmm. its sanity covers them with scar tissue and the pain lessens, but it is never gone. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this uh, quote is really true, um, but I have used my pain and turned it into my purpose to help other grievers, to help other caregivers mm -hmm. and knowing that they're not alone, that your stories are heard you are felt, you're loved, and there are resources out there for you and available to you. Um, I will also post my website um, in the comments as well. You guys are more than willing um, uh, to, to um, you know, reach out, um, and I'll drop a link for my book too. So if you're interested in grabbing that off of Amazon or a signed copy on my website, you can. Again, I just want to thank you, Sarah, for showing up and telling your story. Um, I know sometimes it can be hard. And thank you for doing so on a day like today. That is the, um, the uh, please repeat the day. International Survivors of Suicide Loss. Day. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you again. Um, thank you to everybody who showed up. Um, I will be giving away a self-care box for those yes. or one person who was in attendance today. So again, thank you for, for um, attending. Thank you for commenting, liking, sharing. Uh, we just want to get the word out and mm -hmm. uh, please be in contact with Sarah. Show up on her website, YouTube, Instagram, wherever you can find her. Get with this woman. <laughs> All right. So thank you again, everybody. Thank That's going to end it for us today. Until next time. Peace and lights.